like to welcome everyone this morning to Retail Alliance Drive Loss Prevention. Um, Sarah Pisco, who is on our board of directors, could not be here today. She is the chairman of the Loss Prevention Committee. I'm Beth Parsons, and I help run it for Retail Alliance. Uh, today we have Bill Forbes with Goodwill, who's going to speak to us. And Bill is the director of risk management of Goodwill of Central and Coastal Virginia. He's responsible for the leadership of asset protection, emergency management, disaster recovery, and health and safety functions. He administers the National Industry Security Program as the Facility Security Officer, FSO, and is the Insider Threat Program Senior Official for Goodwill's affiliated clear defense contracting entity, Goodwill Services. Um, Bill is going to go over today what business owners need to keep in mind when looking for shoplifters. He'll explain in detail what indicators you can look for and what tactics shoplifters are implementing to steal from you. And if you have any questions, please uh, put them in the chat and we will get with you uh, during the meeting. Okay, so Bill, thank you for being here with us today. Good, thanks Beth. And just a big thank you to Retail Alliance, uh, Ray, Joey, and uh, Russ for uh, the introduction, Russ Rayner from uh, Goodwill. So appreciate that. And uh, of course, our law enforcement partners for all your support. So thanks for having me today. So we're gonna talk about shoplifting indicators and tactics. And this is the agenda I put together. Uh, we're gonna talk briefly about the shoplifting statute just at a high level, uh, shoplifting impact, indicators and tactics used by shoplifters, and then some deterrent strategies and countermeasures that you as business owners uh, might want to consider in helping to combat this problem. And then risk considerations that come with some of those uh, options. And then we'll have a Q&A. And again, if you have questions along the way, uh, please just um, send a a, uh, chat or raise your hand so that Joey or Beth can uh, call on you and I'm happy to answer those as we go along. All right so just briefly on the Virginia Code uh, because this is important it speaks to what constitutes shoplifting. We all have an idea of what, what some of that is uh, but concealing or taking merchandise also altering price tags. So those ticket switchers that we all deal with, that's also part of this code. Also transferring goods from one container to another. What does that mean? That means like taking a $10 empty uh, trash can in the store, um, removing it, and then maybe putting a bunch of, you know, merchandise, expensive electronics in that, uh, container or in that box that you just emptied. And so when they go to checkout, they pay for 10 bucks and they're getting maybe several hundred dollars worth of goods. And also if one assists others of any of these acts, so that addresses the accomplices and that would have to be some type of active involvement or participation um, to prove intent of those individuals. And then the second paragraph, willful concealment of goods. I just want to reiterate concealment because Commonwealth attorneys prosecute this regularly where it's just concealment um, with the intent to deprive the merchant of that property. And so that is prima facie evidence or evidence on its face that uh, will support the violation of concealment. Now, obviously, there has to be uh, the intent there. So I'll touch on that now. So if there's a shopper in your store and he or she has their hands full of merchandise, maybe they have no basket, maybe uh, nothing to put the items into, and maybe they take, you know, that uh, DVD or maybe a few DVDs that are in their hands. They put them in their back pocket and they're sticking out of their pocket. They're not concealing them all the way. They're just kind of tucking them in there. Everyone can see it. Would I touch that on a concealment case? No, I would not. Uh, to me, that is insufficient to prove uh, concealment. 
and it borders that threshold of turning into a bad stop if you follow through on that. Now, on the flip side, uh, same situation, except this customer uh, has a bunch of clothing and with hangers on it. And this customer then goes to the back corner of the store where no one else is around. They get close to a rack, let's say a clothing rack, and they take off all those hangers. And then you see them tucking those hangers under the clothing rack. And then they ball up those clothes and then conceal them into the front of their pants or into their coat or whatever, you, you know, that would likely satisfy the concealment of the law. And so there we could prove intent uh, through all those measures that that shoplifter did to conceal. At that point, they have violated the law. They do not have to go outside the store. They have already violated it. Now, many merchants will have that policy that, that you know, just to be safe, uh, they allow that shoplifter to bypass the final point of sale and begin to exit or exit the establishment before they take action, if that's in their policy to do so. However, concealment was already committed. All right, let's uh, touch on uh, the statute with petty larceny and grand larceny. Uh, many of you have been around long enough to remember that grand larceny was $200 or more. Uh, and it was that way for a long time. And so it was not difficult to pass that threshold into grand larceny um, for, for a $200 shoplifting case. Um, three years ago, General Assembly bumped that to $500. And then last July during this pandemic, it actually increased again to $1,000. And so if it's under $1,000, it's still petty larceny. Um, so why is that important to us? Well, at least in the loss prevention side, we when we would have a suspect charged with felony shoplifting or felony larceny, that allowed us a degree of leverage because if that person maybe had a clean record, we might negotiate a plea agreement, say, okay, we'll drop it down to petty larceny. We recover the goods, pay, you know, if there's restitution, they would pay that. We would trespass them. We would have that petty larceny conviction. Um, and then we could also pursue civil demand as a civil remedy on top of all that. Uh, but now with this $1,000 threshold, uh, it's a little more difficult to do that. Now, some of you may have merchandise that, you know, $100 shirts or $200 shirts or more expensive product, and you'll still reach that threshold on a typical shoplifting case. But anyways, this is pertinent. And also, if I don't know if there is anyone here that is in the business of selling firearms, but the theft of any firearm is still grand larceny. Uh, so it does not matter the value of the firearm uh, for that one. Uh, punishment. Uh, we probably all recall the three strikes you're out. Um, and so the code reads, and for a third or a subsequent offense, he shall be guilty of a class six felony. So that means, you know, you could have the, the two misdemeanors and then you get the, you know, third one and bam, turns into a class six felony. The Senate Bill 807 attempted to strike this um, last year, and it passed the Senate, but it died in the House. Uh, all that to say is that criminal justice reform is, you know, it's real, it's happening. We've seen some of the reform. Some of it may be absolutely necessary. Some of it, um, you know, we obviously have some controversy there. But that's just a little status of the punishment on that larceny case or the larceny code. All right, let's talk a little bit about shoplifting impact. As we all, you know, we, we wonder, well, gosh, you know, what does that mean? How does it hit retailers? I think for the small business owners, you really get it. You understand that hits your bottom line and your pocket. 
Um, but if you look across the nation here on, on these numbers, uh, courtesy of the last National Retail Federation Security Survey, which you can Google, it's a pretty informative uh, survey report they put out every year. And you'll see uh, in this red column, fiscal year 2019, there was 18% of respondents that reported 3% or higher shrink or stock shortage. That's significant to have 3% or more in today's environment. And you know, you can still see there's a fair amount of that two to 3% and um, just real numbers. But if you average all that out as of 2019, it was an all time high of 1.62% stock shortage. Shoplifting is a component of that. Um, and it does vary depending on what kind of business you're in as to how impactful shoplifting is to you. All right, this is also from the same NRF security survey. It's the new threats and emerging areas of concern reported by the respondents. Of course, this is nationwide. Increasing boldness on part of shoplifters due to bail reforms and criminal justice reforms. Does that sound familiar? You bet it does. More attempted theft without fear of consequences. I think we're all, uh, we've heard of that. We know that shoplifters are bold. They have this predisposition that, hey, consequences are worth it. I'm going for it. The chances of me getting caught might be slim. Even if I do get caught, if I run, I'm probably going to get away. Gift card scams, uh, merchandise theft in fitting rooms. We know that hits us too, uh, unless you can control those fitting rooms. Self-checkout. Gosh, do you think that was on the survey, say, 20 years ago or 10 years ago? Uh, so things are changing. And so imagine a shoplifter at self-checkout. Seriously? <laughs> Man, that, that's got to be interesting stuff. Uh, and then uh, if you look at the very bottom here, opioid addiction. We see that across the board. I know our law enforcement partners are dealing with it. Uh, the mental health community is seeing this. Um, but a lot of people are you know, experiencing trouble with this. Um, and people under the influence of opioids or other types of substances that can impair their judgment and decision-making, uh, they rely on that high, they need money. A lot of times they are committing other offenses, including shoplifting, where they can sell the goods and help support their drug habit. Obviously economic conditions, you know, we know that the poverty uh, has a significant impact as well. Here's some other impacts. So we talked about stock shortage or shrink, basically not having the goods when your inventory system says you have it. You look at the shelf and you show outs. Well, you can't sell if you don't have it. And small business folks know that very well. That also funnels down into reduced profits. If you have reduced profits, you're not going to be able to hire as many people. So you're gonna have a staffing hour reduction. Reduce reinvestment income. If you have less top line, that's less for you to reinvest in your company, less capital improvements that you can make. And then obviously resource costs to combat the problem. We know that there are some things that, you know, we're willing to do to help combat shoplifting, um, but there's also some measures that might be too expensive for us. At Goodwill, we understand, if anyone does, that you know we don't have super deep pockets to uh, put in the highest technology theft reduction systems. And so some things we have to do on a lower budget. All right, so let's move into identifying shoplifters. Um, at a high level, we're going to look at just being aware of shoplifting behaviors and their methods. And keep in mind, just because we're talking about shoplifters, a lot of these behaviors 
carry over to any criminal. It could be a dishonest employee. It could be another criminal that's maybe casing your establishment looking to rob you. Our law enforcement folks know this very well. And so when you can pick up on these behaviors, a lot of times it may help you mitigate a crime, whether it's shoplifting or something else before it happens. Identifying shoplifters does require, require careful observation. Some of you have been in this business a long time, whether you own a business or maybe loss prevention or law enforcement, and you know exactly what you're looking for. But sometimes you pick up different uh, tips through this training. And remember these indicators do not prove shoplifting. Obviously indicators draw your attention and so you start to put the pieces together uh, to help you make a good business decision. All right, so remember your ABCs is pretty simple. Accessories, behaviors, clothing, and shopping habits. All right, so backpacks. When I was in um, retail uh, work and loss prevention on the floor, I always got excited when someone came into my store with a backpack, especially if it looked empty. I got all excited. I thought, here we go, the game's on. And quite, a, quite often it happened that way. So paying attention to the ability to conceal or the means to conceal goods. How are they gonna get that product out of your store? Empty bags. If I saw someone come into my store with a large empty looking bag, um, I would pay attention to that. In fact, um, if the bag has an open top using strategy, I could even walk by the customer by covering my eyes just so they don't see my eyes and I could stare right down into their bag to see what they had. This is a technique you can use as a business owner as well. Um, so, hey, how you doing today? And then maybe the next time you pass them, you're scratching your head. They can't see your eyes because you're shielding your eyes. You're staring right down into their bag. Bam, you know right away, that's an empty bag. Whoa, or maybe it's one small item in one of these really large shopping bags. You know, the ones that you could put like a couple of toddlers in. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, so pay attention to that. Bags from other retailers. Um, Old and wrinkled bags. So if you see a customer coming to your store and then you hear the, the crunching of plastic bags, maybe in a fitting room, maybe in the back corner of your store, and you walk around and you see them with all these plastic bags that are obviously wrinkled or they're pulling them out of a purse, whoa, big indicator, what's going on here? So definitely wanna pay attention. Oversized purses. You can see this uh, video still of this person I'm, I'm showing here uh, coming in with uh, multiple bags, look like two big handbags, I guess, um, fairly flat. One of the handbags has other bags inside of it. So this kind of thing, man, you wanna be all over them. Kill them with kindness, good customer service. Baby strollers, baby bags, oh, all great stuff. I'll tell you, there's no honor among thieves. If they're gonna shoplift, they don't care if the kid's with them. I'm gonna tell you that now. So if you see the baby in the stroller and that stroller has a huge pocket in the bottom that you know you could put another kid in, um, pay attention to that because they, will, they can still steal with babies or children with them. And they often do. Dark sunglasses indoors. Now again, just an indicator it could be that they have sensitive eyes. It could be they have a medical condition. So we have to realize that. Um, however, it's still something we wanna pay attention to because with dark sunglasses on indoors, gives them a great counter surveillance um, leverage over you because they don't have to be looking at you to see you and you don't really see where their eyes are looking at, so. Just something to uh, be cognizant of. Okay, here's a big one. When we talk about behaviors, rubbernecking. Okay, that's the looking back, looking around. The 
police on the call know this well. Someone's getting ready to rob a bank. They're going to rubberneck. Someone's casing to uh, to uh, burglarize a business. They're going to rubberneck. They're going to look around. Even dishonest employees are going to rubberneck because they don't want to be seen. They're looking for people around. They're looking for, uh, am I going to get caught because someone is going to see me? So they're looking around for people back and forth or darting the eyes. Pay more attention to surroundings or people. We talked about that. So think about when you go to a store that you like. What do you do? You walk in, you look at the merchandise. You might say hello to the, uh, the nice uh, retail employees, but then you're going to look at the merchandise. Maybe pick something up. What's the next thing you look at? Probably the price. So you're looking at the goods. Do you necessarily care about other customers walking around? Eh, you know, maybe that environmental awareness is, is healthy to have, um, but you're really not staring at people, you know, paying a lot of attention to them. Shoplifters are paying attention to people around them. They don't want to be around people. They want to get their goods and go somewhere to commit the crime so they can go undetected. A nervous shoplifter will have that hand-eye coordination problem because that comes with nerves. And for those of you who have ever been scared or really nervous over some issue, you'll realize that those fine motor skills all of a sudden diminish. Police on the force know this real well. That's why they practice certain skills regularly. But for the shoplifter who's a novice, they start getting fidgety, they drop stuff, they're nervous. These are indicators. The images you see here on this slide, this uh, person of interest um, stopped after concealing product and turned around to look to see who was following her. Uh, so very nervous, wasn't quite sure what to do. Should I stay and dump it or should I go and take my chances? Um, I love to instill that amount of doubt. And as merchants, you know, we should have that great customer service so that those honest customers appreciate us and the dishonest customers don't want to steal from you and we just want them to go. Hey, Bill. Yes. Um, how about the strollers that have little puppy dogs in them? Because I've noticed that in some of the stores when they're in there, they're all, they're uh, zipped up and you really can't see in there too well, much. Well, the puppy dogs, you mean where they, they enclose totally? Yeah, it's like it's enclosed, but you can kind of see through, it's a mesh, but it's all zipped up to where you could, I couldn't even see, you couldn't even tell there was a puppy in there. But I've seen more and more and I didn't know if anyone was using those. I saw one the other day. Oh, that's, uh, that's a good question, Beth. I haven't seen that um, yet. Uh, haven't apprehended anyone like that yet, but you know, there's always something new. And so if you believe that there is the means to conceal, then that opportunity exists. From there, I'm looking at behaviors. So if you have the opportunity with that puppy dog stroller, and then all of a sudden rapid selection of goods, quirky behavior that's nervous, looking up at cameras, those kinds of things. Yeah, then it starts to draw your attention more. So that's yeah, good. Um, speaking of cameras, looking up at the ceiling, that's a real big amateur shoplifting oopsie daisy. You know, they're looking around to see, all right, are the cameras aimed right at me? Um, when I see that, or when I saw that hunting shoplifters, um, big red flag, especially if they had something of value in their hands at the time. Uh, they may look for a means to conceal. So they'll come into your store, pick up something like a tote bag or a large handbag, backpack that maybe is for sale in your store. When I see that, I immediately pay attention to them because now I know they have the means 
especially if it's a quick, uh, a quick selection. They come in, bam, right away they grab something big that can hold stuff. From there, then I'm going to anticipate where they're going next. Oh, to the rack of $100 Lacoste shirts or whatever. Bam, they're not picking one, they're picking up a handful at a time. Yeah, then it's time to get excited. We wanna shut that down, good customer service, talk about that product. Now, the craftier ones may use a lookout. And so if you have the ability to see customers coming in from the parking lot or from the sidewalk, where they're walking from, sometimes you can see their accomplice outside. Uh, they might be standing outside on the sidewalk, on the phone, or they might be in a car, kind of the getaway car. But then you see this customer coming in on the phone. A lot of, a lot of folks come in on the phone, that's okay. But if I see the connection where someone may be talking to their lookout or an accomplice outside, I'm just kind of putting that in the back of my head like, okay, that could be their backup. So then I'm really paying attention. Also, I've seen where an accomplice will come into the store with them or after the shoplifter and distract employees. And so you know that maybe they're together. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. The novice shoplifters might come in as a pair and then they'll split up. One will distract your employee. The other one will be committing the act of shoplifting. So just being cognizant of that tactic is important. We talked about the ability to communicate with uh, their accomplices and lookouts. All right, let's talk a little bit about clothing. Uh, so baggy clothing just affords the means for concealment. Out of season clothing, that always gets me excited. I saw someone walking just, what was it the other day? I mean, we had 90 degree weather and I saw a person with blue jeans and a, and a black long sleeve jacket on. I'm thinking, gosh, I'm dying here. And uh, this person is really dressed warmly for the warm, hot weather. So anyways, that comes into your store on a 90 degree day, might just be something to pay attention to. Uh, sleeves, obviously uh, possible for concealment. Ball caps. So the thing about ball caps or other headwear uh, is that they can conceal the eyes. Um, and so it conceals it from the cameras much of the time, at least the ones in the ceilings. And it gives a little bit of shade. As you can see here, if I'm wearing a ball cap, it kind of shades my eyes. So it allows me to kind of poke around uh, with my eyes and see who's around, who might be watching me. Uh, so just, uh, it could be innocent, but it could also help them conceal what they're doing. Uh, the person untucks their shirt right when they come into your store or they get out of their car, they're walking to your store, then they untuck that shirt. And you can see the wrinkles all around the bottom of the shirt. Oh, I used to get excited with that. Um, and so anyways, just something to cue into and see if other behaviors or activities start to come together uh, to paint that picture. All right, shopping habits. So making quick and large selections of merchandise. So if I saw someone coming in, let's say a teenager grabs a shopping cart. Teenage boys never grab shopping carts hardly by themselves. Seriously, how cool is that? So when I saw a teenage male grab a shopping cart, I was like, oh yes, this is looking good. And then go over to music or movies, grabbing handfuls of goods, boxes of cologne, um, you know, the DVD player or the game system of the month, whatever that is, putting it in the cart, just like the person had, you know, a free $5,000 gift card to spend. Um, those kinds of behaviors, quick selection, disregard for the price of the goods, all starts to indicate, hmm, suspicion. When you and I look at merchandise that we like, we look at the size, we look at the price. If I pick up a jacket that's $500, I'm going to be like, yeah, that's nice, but not my budget. Uh, so anyways, a shoplifter doesn't care about that. 
refusing help from associates. That's another one. They might acknowledge, you know, the merchant, but they really don't want help. They want to be alone. They want to commit their crime without any undue attention. They'll avoid associates or employees, and they'll often go to that isolated part of your sales floor. We all have them. Um, sometimes you have the ability to design the layout of your sales floor, and sometimes you just don't. Um, so having open sight lines of your uh, establishment is really helpful. If you kind of avoid those high spots, those isolated corners, it just makes it easier to uh, see those customers in your store. Bill? Yes. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is from Ellen, Ellen Gonzalez with Chesapeake Police. She was wondering, um, can you still charge people with possession of burglary tools if they come in with a knife used to cut packages or empty bags? Back in the day, they never had a problem getting a warrant, but didn't know if that was still the case. Yeah, you know, if a knife is used to commit the larceny, I've always seen where police would charge for that. And um, then it goes before the court. Uh, so I would say probably so uh, if it's actively used. But um, I haven't prosecuted a shoplifting case in quite a while with, you know, a knife used. Uh, but that's a great question. I would think it would. And I have another one from Russ Rayner. Yeah. Sure. Hear about a team, one pulling lower price tagged and the other putting the hidden low price tags on the higher value merchandise. Oh, a question on ticket switching, covering up a, a price tag. Is that what that is? If I heard that right? Yeah, I think yeah, it is. So, yeah, That's the right. ticket switchers. You know, they hit us at Goodwill too. The same thing, just it's crazy. I'm like, wait a second. The stuff is affordable. Why are you taking and peeling off a $2.25 price tag to put it on the $5.25, you know, housewares item. But we see it all the time. And yes, they can cover a price tag or a lot of them will just, you know, use the fingernail and they'll pick off the uh, price tag, put a different one on there. It does help sometimes if you have uh, higher price goods, you might want to put more than one price tag on that item maybe two different locations uh, we found to be helpful. Okay, he was wondering, do you see very many teams, that people that work together doing this? Oh, teams for yeah. uh, ticket switching? Yes. Uh, my hearing's going too. Um, I don't normally see teams and accomplices doing ticket switching. Um, interestingly, the cases that we deal with, that I've dealt with, have been individuals. Um, so that, that's a good question. I haven't seen uh, the organized ticket switching groups as opposed to the ORC, which we'll get to in a minute, the organized retail crime, totally different story. Uh, but good question. Uh, no, I haven't seen that. Moving in an unusual manner. So let me just share this example with you. It wasn't actually a shoplifting case but it was behavior that we all need to be cognizant of because it was actually a burglary uh, where a, uh, a subject entered our store right before closing, walked around the back of the store, back and forth, wasn't looking at merchandise and just looking around, scanning the area, went into the bathroom in the back of the store. A little suspicious maybe, Okay, right before close, uh, increased risk of robberies, um, but not interested in merchandise, goes to the bathroom, kind of a, in the back of the store. From that point, he never came out. He got into the bathroom, climbed up on the countertop, and at that particular store, we had drop ceiling tiles. Uh, he climbed up, he was able to reach the ceiling tile, climbed up into the ceiling, put the ceiling tile back, he waited until the store closed, everyone left, climbed around. Later on, he uh, uh, poked through uh, ceiling tile, 
and uh, stole some stuff and got away just before uh, police rolled up on the scene. Almost got him, but uh, he got away for a while. He got arrested later. Um, so the, the moral of that story is if you have a low ceiling in your bathroom or could be a fitting room for that matter that is accessible with drop ceiling tiles, that is a point of entry for someone to get in there and hide and then commit a crime after you're all gone. Um, they can also conceal evidence above ceiling tiles. So now all of our new stores that we build, you can imagine hard ceilings in the bathroom. Uh, if it's a fitting room, we're gonna have a hard ceiling in there too. We're just trying to mitigate those problems that we know can occur. So a little tip for you there. We talked about lingering in corners, fitting rooms or hot spots, isolated areas, moving merchandise from one area to another. I worked a, uh, a booster case. Boosters are basically your full-time professional thieves that steal for resale value. They get paid uh, for items they steal. Uh, so I was working this booster case and it was uh, this, this one lady that kept hitting me. This wasn't Goodwill, this is long before Goodwill, um, but she had two lookouts and the lookouts were kind of circling but they didn't circle where I was hiding on the sales floor. And so I had a great view under a rack and I'm watching this go down. I had backup on the camera, you know, the glory days, right? And this shoplifter, this booster was uh, grabbing handfuls of baby clothes, toddler clothes, took them over to another rack, set them down, continue to grab and select big quantities of baby clothes walk back to that staging area, set them down. When she was ready to uh, do it, then she stood behind that rack, kind of looking out on the sales floor, no idea I was watching her, pulling these hangers off, hiding the hangers, hiding the hangers. Rolled them all up, bundled them up, and concealed them in her brassiere and the front of her shorts in a booster belt. Basically, elastic that holds all that stolen product tight to the body, makes a great way to conceal for these boosters. And that's what she did. And that's what she was doing. She was staging that product to where she wanted to commit the uh, concealment. Um, Bill? Yes. Uh, Sarah with Chesapeake Police wrote in, with the drop ceilings, train your employees to look for that residue on countertops before they close, when you move a ceiling tile, there's usually some debris that falls onto the surfaces below. Yeah, that's a good tip. Thank you, Sarah. And you know what else this, uh, that burglar left in the bathroom was his shoe prints on the wall. <laughs> so, you know, you're looking for debris. Also look for the shoe prints going up the wall. Good grief, these people. Thank you, Sarah. All right, so kind of all this leads us to, as business owners, uh, merchants, is perform that shoplifting assessment. You know, things that we just talked about, your target hardening, uh, you know, do you have, um, you know, drop ceiling tiles that are accessible? Is there a way to mitigate that risk? Do you have high shrink categories? Maybe you have the ability to run a report that shows you're getting killed on Lacoste shirts or electric toothbrushes or whatever it is. But knowing where your high shrink areas are is a one of those first steps in fighting the problem. Because that might help you think, well, oh, maybe I don't place them there. Or maybe I need to spend more of, you know, have my employee really work this area with good customer service. Another one is, are you a target for ORC, organized retail crime? You know, those are the folks that are coming in, and they're hitting you hard on things that are really popular. You know, resaleable things like, you know, baby formula, diapers, over-the-counter drugs, medications, cough syrups, that kind of stuff, electronics, um, 
you know, clothing too, you know, especially the good stuff. So uh, just knowing if you have some big um, outs of certain high value product, that could point to a, an ORC problem. Where in the store is a theft occurring? And so, you know, if you're walking your store and you find day in, day out, you have a bunch of empty hangers stuffed behind that tall book rack in the corner of your store, okay, that's probably an indicator you're having a problem back there. Uh, it's a concealment spot. Data analytics, that just helps you identify those top loss categories. And then we also talked about the vulnerabilities. You know, isolated areas, not the best for loss control. Um, sometimes we can't impact that, but if you can, good for you. Better visibility always helps in crime prevention, whether it's inside your store or around the perimeter of your property. Keeping those shrubs, you know, pruned down, keeping the trees pruned up, good lighting, you know, not putting a thousand marketing posters across your front glass, all those kinds of things. You probably hear from the, uh, uh, the police crime specialists all the time. Uh, so those are always helpful. All right, let's talk about some other shoplifting tactics. I mentioned booster belts or booster bags, basically appliances that help those professional shoplifters take higher quantity of goods uh, faster and undetected, um, hopefully in their mind. So the booster belts could be just elastic, you know, girdles or homemade elastic um, underwear that holds a lot of product. I mean, some of these things you can put power drills in and they'll hold them up. Uh, so the bags, you can see at the top right of this slide, uh, just a uh, fabricated booster bag, you know, the foil lining. Uh, in some cases, those would defeat the uh, EAS, electronic article surveillance uh, systems found in some of our stores. Cutting and prying tools. Uh, so we, you know, we had that question about the knives, but you know, if you're hearing snipping or cutting or popping uh, of tags or barbs, your ears can be just as important as your eyes. You might not be able to see the person in the fitting room or they might be on the other side of the rack from you, but you hear that popping, pop, pop. Okay, you know right away, oh, that's my price tag that's getting popped. Um, or that sounds like pliers in the fitting room, all right? And we can have some fun with that. Uh, just a quick thing on fitting rooms, while we're talking about it, is if you believe you have a shoplifter hitting you in the fitting room and you don't control that fitting room um, by piece counts or by locking the door, it's just kind of a free for all. Um, if you believe a crime is happening, you hear a plastic bag shuffling like it's getting stuffed, you see price tags dropping to the floor under that short door, uh, these kinds of things, here's a tactic. It's fun to do and it works almost every time. The manager stands outside the fitting room door, uh, holds her cell phone to their ear and says, yes, hello, this is Bill Forbes calling from uh, Goodwill at uh, Hampton. Uh, yes, the address is 1911 Seville Row. Uh, yes, that's Hampton. And then as I'm talking out loud, loud enough for the person in the fitting room to hear me, then I start walking away from the fitting room. And then I'm going to go and kind of put myself maybe 30 feet away from the fitting room, closer to the front, closer to the exit, look back, and I'm going to wait for that person to come out of that fitting room. And as they come out, I'm going to probably pass them, walk into that fitting room, grab the tags or evidence that they just dropped. I'm going to walk back out so they see me, and now I'm going to walk towards the front. And I still have the phone in my ear. I never use police, I never use shoplifting or theft in anything I said. I just said my name, who I'm with, and the address to my store, and what do you think that individual thinks I'm doing? Calling the cops, of course. And so I've seen them run out of the store before after I've done that. I tell you, it's, it's pretty funny. So that's one tactic that you can deploy 
don't get hurt doing it. You're not going to, you know, you don't want to confront someone, but you can be, uh, you can handle it that way. And they will almost always drop that merchandise and get out of your store. All right, we talked about the distractions and accomplices. Uh, we also talked about the phone and Bluetooth devices, staging areas, getaway vehicle or a driver. So let's say it's, um, uh, you know, near closing time, a car pulls up outside on the curb right in front of your store, driver stays in the car, the passenger gets out, leaves the passenger door open and comes into your store and starts acting suspicious, avoiding you, um, not receptive to customer service, the hair on the back of your neck should stand up at that point. Something doesn't feel right. They don't want your help um, and they're looking nervous. Maybe they're there to shoplift. Maybe they're there to rob you. Um, but that kind of thing you want to pay attention to because you potentially have a getaway driver staged right out there with the door open, ready to hit it when that guy uh, robs your store. Uh, so here's some things you can do. You can page additional employees to your sales floor for zoning or call it what you want. You know, come up with your own interior, uh, internal. I probably wouldn't say a code 25 because that draws too much. You know, it's like, Code 25, what's going on? But if you say, you know, I need all associates to the sales floor uh, for cleanup or re-merchandising or whatever, you know, you might only have three employees, four or five employees, depending on the size, but get them all out on the sales floor because more is better when it comes to crime prevention. Uh, spread out a little bit. You don't want them all corralled together, uh, but kind of moving around, acknowledging any customers, uh, so that's one strategy. The other one is, let's say Sarah and I are working on the sales floor. This guy comes in, he's looking really suspicious, quirky, nervous, appears to be under the influence of something. I have a potential getaway car on the front curb with the door open. Um, we're feeling uncomfortable here. So something I can do is say, hey, Sarah, and this is going to be said so that this guy hears me. I can say, hey, Sarah, I just talked to uh, Chesapeake Police Department and they're gonna send an officer out here momentarily to take that report from yesterday's event. Okay, so at that point, this guy is hearing police coming anytime. Okay, I'm probably not gonna rob this store. Now that might only work once if he comes back tomorrow night. Well, okay, then we might, might have to back up and punt. But for that situation, a lot of these guys that are coming in to do, you know, they're flying by the seat of their pants. They're thinking this far off the front of their nose. And if they hear police coming soon, um, probably going to leave and move on. So just another tactic there um, to help discourage bad behavior. All right, quick touch on fraudulent returns. This used to be a big problem in the 90s. A lot of retailers have uh, gotten smart over the years on how to reduce this problem, but it can still happen depending on the nature of your business. Um, so, you know, the uh, shoplifter or the thief comes in and buys something, probably on a stolen credit card, but they buy something of, of value. Uh, they take it home, they remove the contents, they weight it down with something of a similar weight, and then they retape the box carefully or re-shrink wrap it themselves because they can do that. And then they bring it back in and get a refund. So when they're coming in for that refund, it could be some pennies, it could be, you know, other empty boxes, um, some duct tape and whatever, uh, a few soup cans, something given at the approximate weight, and they get their refund. So let's say a vacuum cleaner that's 600 bucks, they come in, it looks factory sealed, they have a receipt, and for the untrained, unprepared uh, return employee, they may accept that refund and process that. 
Um, so whatever your procedure is, uh, you know, you'll want to follow that. But, um, you know, just uh, being cautious, particularly if you get taken on the first one, you're probably going to pay more attention on the, uh, the other returns of high value product. But product can be open sometimes discreetly, but follow your, uh, your company's direction on that. Uh, this can get costly. It can add up quick um, if you're not attuned to it. All right, we're talking about some deterrent strategies. We want to treat every shoplifter like a customer, not every customer like a shoplifter. Um, and so honest people like good service. Um, maybe they don't need help. That's okay. Um, if you're a guy like, you know, like me, I usually need help because I can't find stuff in stores. I don't know. Maybe it's a guy thing. Maybe it's just a bill thing. But uh, I usually will take help if someone's around. Hey, where do I find this widget? Uh, steer me in the right direction. Be great. Um, so good service is always appreciated. And dishonest people don't really like it. That's okay. All right. Um, so being visible, we call this perception of detection. If we can instill a perception of detection that that potential shoplifter is being observed and will likely get caught committing that crime, then that in of itself is good deterrence. And that's what we want to do. Highly visible, engaged employees greet every customer coming in with eye contact. Hey, thanks for coming in to Goodwill. Appreciate you supporting our mission. Dishonest people don't like that engagement. They want to come in like with the blinders up. I hope no one's seeing me or paying attention to me. I sure hope they can't ID me. Um, but honest people like it. Engage them throughout their visit if you can. You know, be in those areas that they're shopping and talk about that merchandise. Um, even if you think the person is suspicious, they have a whole, um, you know, wad of denim in their shopping cart. Talk about it with them. Give them that eye contact and say, oh, yeah, you know, we sell a lot of that denim. That's good stuff. You can't beat the price on that. I'll be right around here if you need, you know, need any help. If you need more help on the floor, page more help to the floor. Um, particularly if you think you might have an accomplice or someone distracting for a shoplifter. But importantly, never accuse. You don't want to accuse someone of, of shoplifting or stealing or, or whatever um, up until the point where you decide to take action if that's within your policy guideline. All right, fitting rooms. That's a hot spot used to drive me crazy, um, you know, in uh, the old days, uh, you know, if we had fitting rooms all throughout the store and um, you could walk the floor all night and not see a darn thing and then a close in, you're checking the fitting rooms and you find 10 uh, security tags sitting on the corner. You're like, ah, you know, there's a hundred dollars or 150 bucks or whatever it was, you know, probably a hundred dollars a shirt, you know, bam. It only takes a few minutes. And so controlling them is best case if you can. Uh, some retailers can do that where they, they might have someone working that fitting room area. They can keep those fitting rooms controlled, either locked or maybe a numbering card system. They can do a piece count. They know what's going in, what's coming out. They're, those fitting rooms are kept clean and neat. That's the ideal situation. Um, you may not be able to do that in your business. At least keeping them clean and monitored is the next best thing. Shoplifters and thieves, criminals, they like disorganization. They like clutter. Even dishonest employees like this because when there's clutter and there's a mess and there's merchandise everywhere and stuff, then the crime and the evidence just kind of blends in. It's a beautiful thing for them. And so what we want to do is keep those fitting rooms neat and clean. 
if we can't control them entirely. Now, if you do have someone who you believe uh, you've made nervous, you know, you think that they were in the process of shoplifting, going back to that fitting room situation, you want to give that customer some room to discard that concealed merchandise. I've seen this play out both ways. If, if I knew they concealed, um, either on the floor or in the fitting room, in the bathroom, and I rode them too closely, then sometimes they just don't know what to do. It's like, I can't dump this stuff because the guy's right on my heels and they'll just take their chances and walk out the door. Um, but if you give them some space, you kind of position yourself between them and the exit, not physically blocking them if that's, you know, that's your thing, but um, just being up there or maybe having the phone to your ear like you're talking to someone and just giving them eye contact. Giving them that eye contact, they see you, they're paying attention to you, they know that you're paying attention to them and they're really not sure, but they think they're busted. If you give them that room, they will oftentimes turn around, go back to the concealed part of the store, ditch the goods and leave your store. But you have to give them that room. As soon as you see them go behind that rack in the corner, give them a moment, start walking a little bit closer. And when they come back out, you walk through, you pick up that discarded merchandise in your hand and you're holding it and you let them know that you're holding it. You give them that eye contact and you don't even have to say a thing. They know exactly what, what's going on and they'll leave your store. Hopefully they don't come back. Now, in some cases you may um, be empowered to trespass individuals or ban them. We do it all the time. The ticket switchers, you know, if we have a shoplifting case, a donation larceny case, if we have evidence, whether video or um, a management observation of everything that happened, then we can support banning that individual. And we often do. We get them out of the system. And for us, that's a good business decision because our merchandise is pretty inexpensive usually. So if we can get them out of the system, cut that tie, that's one less dishonest person in our stores. And, uh, and that's a good thing for us. Uh, so keep that in mind. If, if you can support that somehow through evidence, um, then banning them, trespassing them uh, can be a very productive response to this problem. I've even, you know, when I worked the uh, floor before uh, years back, if I had someone conceal on me, but then I lost them, um, I knew they're, what they were doing, but maybe they turned a corner and then it took me, you know, another 30 seconds to catch up with them, but I knew what they did. As they were leaving the store, I would tell them, don't come back in my store. And they would not come back in my store uh, because they were uncomfortable. They knew what I was there for and I had what I needed so that they would not come back. Um, now, talking about some more deterrent strategies. If you see this picture here, this is, I don't know what it is. It looks like a bathing suit store or a lingerie. I don't know. I just picked it on the internet because it was a good example. And so when you come into this store, it has open sight lines. It's beautiful, good lighting, clear glass. Um, you can see all the way through it. Employees can see customers clearly. This is ideal if you can do something with open sight lines. Once you start getting those tall fixtures that block views, especially we put them in the corner, it's just, you know what's gonna happen behind them and you just have to uh, step up your patrols, your foot traffic into those corners, try to keep them flushed out, good customer service. Train your associates. So take some of the content you learned today, train your staff if you're not already, you probably already do, uh, but you know what to look for, how to engage, how to give that good customer service to help in your loss control efforts. You know, let them know 
you know, what your policy is on responding to shoplifters. Uh, more and more retailers are going with a hands-off approach, maybe not even uh, detaining or challenging a shoplifter. That's probably the safest bet. It's dangerous work. Um, you know, we're not law enforcement. So stopping someone with bare hands, um, you know, that's dangerous. Been a lot of fights, a lot of wrestling. Um, and it's just, uh, it's not something that y'all want to do. So you have to know what you're getting into and understand the risks if you are going to have a shoplifting apprehension policy. Uh, video systems are helpful. Um, most of the time they're not monitored in, in live time. You know, we don't always have the ability to do that. If, you know, we only have a few employees, old school was, yeah, you'd have someone in the camera room, you'd have someone on the floor, you had some backup. Today's environment might not look like that, but video cameras are still helpful. They have their place. They're good for accident investigations. They're good for going back after an incident occurred and getting useful information. Um, placement of those video cameras, law enforcement will tell you all the time, is critical. Having a good system, you'd probably be better off having a few cameras that are really nice and clear than a whole bunch of cameras that you're like, what is that? You know, so go higher quality. It's all about quality, not quantity when it comes to cameras. One other thing too, is when it comes to identifying criminals, a really good camera strategy is at your front door, instead of aiming the camera, you know, like from inside the sales floor, looking at the plate glass or the glass door where you have all that backlighting back here from the sun, you'll probably see a beautiful silhouette of someone with no detailed features. So instead, and this happened to me the hard way, you know, I, I had to learn, uh, you know what, vendor, you know, that may have some features on the camera, but it's still a silhouette body coming in that door. So I started mounting those cameras the other way. Uh, and you'll see this in some other retailers too. They'll put that camera up above the door or beside the door. Lower is better because if it's low, you get underneath the ball caps. And I have some beautiful pictures of people wearing the ball cap, and their face right there, color coded, high definition. They had no idea. And bam, you can get that bolo out, uh, be on the lookout image uh, to your employees, to law enforcement. Uh, it's just a great camera. They do make some uh, height strip cameras, you know, so they have the height strip. Not every retailer wants that in their, in their store, and I get that. Uh, but they have uh, embedded cameras, a little covert camera in them. Um, but just taking a, a high quality megapixel IP camera, mounting it low, facing inward, will probably give you what you need. Convex mirrors. These are helpful for those blind spots that we talked about. Putting those in the corners if you have to. Mirrors are helpful. They make the space look bigger. They help customers hold up stuff to see if it's gonna look good on them. Um, but also they can help because it just creates this, this situation where more people could be looking at me with all these mirrors around. The convex mirrors help with the visibility up um, in those blind spots. Merchandise placement is important. Um, and you know, loss prevention and, and um, and the merchandising team, sometimes we didn't always see eye to eye, uh, but uh, you know they want merchandise out there, very visible, and that's good. We want it visible too. Um, sometimes we would get nervous having you know the $500 gaming systems not locked up, but I get it. You know, you're trying to sell more. If you don't have someone to help uh, unlock and service those customers sufficiently, that could be lost sales, so we understand. But putting your higher value, um, you know, high ticket, higher theft goods in places that are more visible is helpful. If you put that merchandise in the back isolated corners of your store, good luck. Um, it's just easier to steal, easier to bag up, and if no one's working those corners, uh, theft is easier to get away with. 
loss prevention staff, um, you know, I know things are lean and mean these days. If you can afford that in your business model, terrific. Um, having trained staff and uh, understanding of those policies is always a plus in the store. If you can't, training your associates on best practices to reduce losses would be next best. EAS or electronic article surveillance. Uh, those are like the, you know, tags. Uh, back in the day, we would actually have a roll of these tags, you know, about yay big. We peel them off this roll, stick them on to whatever. Uh, I don't know. I probably have carpal tunnel putting these tags on stuff. Uh, laborious work. Um, those systems um, might be okay for certain retailers and others, maybe not so much. Um, there is a capital investment and you also have to test them. You have to service them. There is a customer distraction component because customers come in or leave and it sets it off and they're probably not stealing. Uh, so you have to evaluate those solutions carefully to see if it's right for you. Uh, the, all the newer systems, the bigger box retailers, they have their tags embedded in the merchandise, the packaging from their vendors. So it's all in the supply chain now. It comes to their stores already tagged, which works better for them. The ink tags is another solution. Um, you know, similar, they can, it can be EAS, but also have that ink tag component. Um, it helps deter theft, mostly of the novice. Um, your boosters won't care about that. Your boosters are going to defeat those um, or they'll just bag it up, cruise out your door to an awaiting car and, and they'll be gone. Also, they can buy tag removers on the internet. Oh, whoever thought that was a good idea. I know the police, loss prevention folks were like cringing. Really? They even put YouTube videos out there on how to do it. I'm like, arrest those people. But anyways, I'm just, uh, sorry, I'm my soapbox now. But all that is out there. And so the crooks know the tools, they get the training, they train each other, and it's this constant cat and mouse thing. If you look at the image on the bottom right of this screen, you'll see I don't know what the product is, deodorant maybe, uh, but it is a theft deterrent fixture. And so you see a lot of these in place in the larger retail stores, uh, pharmacies, and this is to help from the boosters coming in, grabbing handfuls of this product, scooping it into their shopping cart or to their booster bags and blasting out the fire exit door to an awaiting vehicle, whatever. So it helps reduce the time, or actually increases the time for them to select. The honest shopper, you know, us, we'll go in, we'll get one of those, you know, maybe two, uh, but we're not looking to clear out the shelf. And so those fixtures have been helpful to some retailers. All right, so I uh, talked about here, you know, this individual person of interest, fill the bag with other handbags. And so the managers gave her eye contact out on the sales floor so she knew she was had. The managers then put themselves up at the front of the store so that the person of interest sees them and, you know, hold the phone to the ear and, hello, this is Jane Doe calling from Acme store, whatever. Our address is blah, blah, blah. What do you think happened? You know, the suspect got nervous, discarded all this product, recovered the goods, no injuries, done in a, just a moment. So just a good tactic that can be done. Bill? Yes. Um, I have a couple of things here. Um, Sarah with Chesapeake Police says, uh, you can call the police for the suspicious vehicle. It's easier to get the license plate number before the suspect jumps in and takes off. And then Ray wrote, first of all, thank you for your time and presentation. Always so informative. Will you touch on store layout as a way to deter shrinkage? Just a okay, touch. Sure will. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, license tags, 
critical. Um, good information there. Store layouts. And so, you know, the best case scenario for a store layout is to avoid tall fixtures that hide people, that create blind spots, places where sh shoplifters or criminals can isolate. Um, so having lower racks, open sight lines, good lighting, um, you know, I guess best case is I can think of one of our stores. It's, it's an older store that we just acquired the space. It was even before I started. And the space is kind of chopped up into almost like three parts. So there's lots of hiding spots. That's not a good layout from a loss control perspective. Um, but if we open that up so that there are no hiding spots, um, even you can see the restrooms, Think about you know some of the major big box retailers today where they have the restrooms up at the front past the point of sale. That's excellent. One, it's convenient for the customer coming in your store, but two is, hey, you know, it's really pretty awkward for a shoplifter to grab a cart full of goods, take it past the registers into the bathroom. So it's good loss control having those up at the front. Um, fitting rooms, if you can place those somewhere closer to where associates work, where there's uh, more frequent observation. Those are the ones that are not controlled, that just unlocked, customers can use. Better visibility is important. Um, if they're controlled, you just have to make sure you have someone close enough to uh, support those customers. Um, locked up fixtures. Uh, so, if you have certain items that are really expensive that you really can't afford to have stolen, you may consider locking those up in a fixture. Just remember, you need to have good customer service close by to tend to those customers if they want to look at that. So a little bit about uh, store layout. Uh, keep those front glass window panes free of clutter. You want people to see out. You want people to see in. You want passers-by to be able to see into your business. You want police to be able to look in there. Have some security lighting on after hours. That helps. Same thing, crime prevention. If you have cameras, it also gives some uh, lighting for the cameras. Just a few tips on, on store layout. Uh, how are we doing on time? Looks like we're uh, getting, getting close here, huh? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so just a quick touch on apprehensions as I, as I go to wind up is make sure you have a policy to do that. It is dangerous. You do need to be able to prove intent, whether it's through concealment or exiting without payment. And um, keep in mind, everything you do today will be recorded on someone's phone. You'll probably have multiple people posting it to Instagram, YouTube, and all that. And so that can work for or against you. Uh, certainly reputationally, hey, it, it's probably not going to paint a nice picture with an altercation on your sidewalk over a shoplifter, but some still do it. Um, other tips, police will tell you this too, is as merchants, maintain your files and evidence. Maybe the shoplifter got away today. Save the video, save the video stills, photograph what they left behind. If you have a license tag, great. Um, but when you maintain that, they're probably gonna come back, which can help you resolve that case with law enforcement assistance. Document well, we talked about vehicles. Share the, the bolos, those descriptions, the be on the lookouts with your staff so they know who they're looking for. Just don't leave them out in public view. You don't want video stills being left out at the register or posted somewhere where the public can see it. And your witnesses preferably should be store management. Um, so favorable outcomes, uh, recover your merchandise, maybe prosecution, maybe not, depending on the value and that business decision. Civil demand is a civil penalty afforded in Virginia for merchants to recover up to $350. It depends on the case, but that, that's a civil penalty totally apart from the criminal justice system. Um, and so 
we use a law firm to help us recover civil demand against people we can identify. And lastly, banning the individuals, if you can, um, that's a safe thing to do. It helps avoid injuries, miss work from injuries, claims, also your court hearings, keep that in mind. You might have to go to court two or three times. Um, so if it's a $10 item, something to keep in mind. We talked about reputation and the posted videos, also lawsuits and bad stops. Those can be very expensive. And so if you are going to make shoplifting stops, know those risks because there are several. And um, I'm always happy to uh, uh, consult with you if you'd like uh, to discuss that further. Only apprehend if it's safe, if you're trained, following policy, making good business decisions, having your appropriate witnesses, and, um, and use you know, video if you have that, or management observation. We talked about evidence and do documenting your files, contacting law enforcement for help. Um, you know, just follow your policy though. If you don't have all the steps and you're not sure if the person stole from you, just remember if the police show up, it, it does escalate matters. And so you don't want the person to accuse you of defamation if they don't have stolen goods on their person or you don't have evidence of a concealment violation. And we uh, briefly ORC, there's the boosters, there's the fences. We could spend a separate class on this another time, um, but uh, that's just a more organized, high value, high impact type losses that are in the resale business. And we talked about ticket switchers and banning them if you have evidence to support the decision of, uh, of that countermeasure. All right, bottom of the basket, don't forget to look under your baskets, prevent those accidental losses, and also looking inside other product, training your cashiers to open up other items to look inside always, or Lisa. Again, those accidental things that the customer mistakenly put in there, we can correct that. If you use fixtures, use them correctly. Make sure they lock and protect your high value goods. In this case, it's well done and we're done. I'll take any questions you have. Okay. Now I'm back. No, I think we asked so many questions during your presentation. All of them were covered. Well, Bill, we thank you for this. This is a lot of good information. Um, and this will be going out um, to all of our members and uh, a lot of other people. Kylie did write that was very informative to thank you very much. Um, great presentation from Sarah Everett with our Chesapeake police. And that is really, really good. Um,